All right. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the fifth Tuesday, which means that tonight is going to be the CFA, a CFA open form Bible study. Open form Bible study means that, well, for the time being, we're going to be fielding some questions, or I will, concerning the book of Revelation. And I had thought to maybe set up some kind of a study plan or just break things down the way that you would normally approach opening up a study for a group of people. But the Lord directed me to just get questions from you all to move into that subject matter. So we're going to do that. But first, I'll just take a moment and lead us in a, in a prayer. And Father God, I thank you for everyone that is coming on the Zoom tonight. I thank you for everyone that wants to be here, but for whatever reason, uh, they could not make it work. But I thank you, Lord, for the technology that allows us to record all of this. And, and for anyone that wants to come back later, they can view it. And your spirit is still minister to them to open things up. So I ask, Father God, that as we go into the Word of God tonight, that there would be no impediments that would keep us from hearing what the Spirit is saying or that keep us from understanding what you want us to know. I ask you, Father God, on the, for the, for, just for your glory to come forward. And please, Lord, have mercy upon all of us that if there is some sin, some transgression, some iniquity, some darkness, some offense, something that we're guilty of, Please forgive us of that. Have mercy upon us because we thank you for the mercy that you extend to us daily. And we do not take it for granted and never will. So I thank you for the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. I thank you for the position that we are brought into because of that blood to stand in righteousness. And I thank you for the release of the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you tonight. So we thank you for all of these things before we even experience them. But we know, Lord, you'll be glorified as we move into the word of God tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone that would agree with that prayer, you can say amen. 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 All right, folks. So uh, tonight, if there's a question that you've had about the book of Revelation, the things that we've looked at so far, well, the last thing that we looked at, we looked at the beast, we've looked at the woman, we've looked at the, the horseman, we've even, the last time we were together, took a look at the millennial, the millennial reign. And there's so much to be understood about the book of Revelation. And, and there's one thing that I wanted to do before before fielding whatever questions might be there. And as you can see, my um, my Bible software is open up to Proverbs 25. And you all should be able to see what it says here. And well, verse one, it says, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah copied out. And there's a reason why Solomon is called the wisest man in the Bible, with the exception of the Lord Jesus. Can't be wiser than him. He has access to everything. But in terms of just straightforward wisdom and insight and depth, Solomon was that. He asked for that, and he received that. He asked for wisdom. He could have. The Bible says that the Lord told him he could ask for anything that he wanted, and what he chose was wisdom. And because he chose wisdom, God gave him so much more. But I'm just saying these things because this passage that I wanted us to take a, a moment to look at is the second verse in chapter 25, where it says that the glory of God, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And 
I know we're looking at the book of Revelation, but I wanted to come here first because there's so much that is, for all intents and purposes, hidden. It's concealed in the book of Revelation, but it's not it's not hidden away from us. I don't know if you all can see the note that I have here to myself on the other side of the Bible software. Things are not hidden from us. They are hidden for us. And so I just wanted to take a minute to take a look at this passage. And if there's anyone that has anything that you would like to say about this particular passage before we go into the book of Revelation, and I and I hope to hear the, the question for tonight or some of the questions for tonight, we'll do that. But if there's something that you want to say about uh, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, well, please, let's hear it. And do remember, we are recording this. <laughs> so it's really useful to have someone saying, something um, I, I just want to say one thing pastor that 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 verse is uh it tells us about the depth of god's word for sure uh, like i said i've read the bible a few times uh but every single time i read the bible i will find new hidden gems in certain words certain phrases but i've gotten to the habit i'll go and see a certain word I'm like, okay, where have I seen this word before? And I will research that word. And then you start finding different meanings or a, a deeper, not a different meaning, but a deeper interpretation of what God has really got in his word. Because sometimes we just read it and try to say, well, I'm going to read five verses today, or I'm going to five, uh, read uh, five chapters today or whatever. And sometimes we rush through the word. But when you really take your time and just scrutinize it, just really pay attention to what you're reading, Wow. That's all I can say. Wow. Amen. 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 I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Anyone else? Well, let me let me amplify on this just a little bit. I love this passage. And uh, I say that with an understanding that I love everything about the word of God. <laughs> There's nothing that I don't love, even the hard things, even the challenging things. I love whatever God's got to say. I want to know it. I want to hear it. And I love this particular passage because it's, it's really, it's really uh, encouraging because there's so much that we don't know so much that we do want to understand, so much that we feel like is just beyond us. But it's, to me, it, um, it's given us some insight into God and into what we should be about and what he's expecting from us. He's the God that knows everything and, and he's got it veiled. I mean, we think about the tabernacle in the wilderness or the tabernacle that was built by Solomon or or any of the temples that, that were constructed with the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And the veil is there um, just to keep you from seeing what's on the other side until you can press your way into it. And fortunately for us, whatever was on the other side of that veil up until the days of the high priest and the priesthood and all of that, Jesus came and tore that veil down. And now we have free access beyond the veil into the most holy place. So there's, there, there's things that God has for us. If we will press our way through and it will stay veiled or will stay unknown unless we really want to know what's there. And as we press to know him, he opens things up for us. And what we thought we could not know, he will show it to us. The scripture says that for those that fear him, he will show them his salvation. He will show them and teach them his covenant, which is a great word itself, covenant. But 
people that may not be, let's just say, fortified enough to press or um, have the have the um, sheer passion and desire to know a thing, then they won't. But if you do have the passion and the desire and, and you really want to know and you keep coming to God to know, the scripture says that's very honorable and you're moving in a place of royalty when you do that. The honor of kings, the honor of kings, male, female, doesn't matter because we have the king of kings on the inside of us that is going to open these things up to us. So I just think it's an awesome, awesome verse. It, it tells me, keep pressing in to know. Keep The Bible says, Jesus said, seek and you shall find. He says, ask. He says, knock. And he says, do it continually. So it is the honor of kings to search out a matter because it is the glory of God to conceal it until you really, really want to know and you keep pressing, you will know. And so anyway, I just wanted to share that. I, I just, I'm just so very, very um, moved by this particular passage of scripture. All right. And, and there's one other thing, Pastor, and I think you touched up on it uh, probably a month or two ago, just in the, the, the way God hides meanings in his word in the Hebrew language, uh, like uh, in the beginning, God, and how the whole uh, uh, plan of God is basically written right there in Hebrew, if you, if you discern it. Yes. And, and, and even in the genealogy in the, uh, the book of Genesis. The genealogy in there has the full plan of God for men, and nobody knows that unless you start studying that and and, and look at the significance of each name that is on there in that genealogy, and then you see the interpretation. That really blowed my mind when I when I seen that. I was like, wow. So there's some beautiful hidden gems hidden in that Bible in a lot of areas. Yes. Amen. Uh, if you all are unfamiliar with what Lewis is saying, which I think many of you probably are familiar with it, but just to give you an idea, when he said the genealogy in Genesis, uh, all right, this isn't the book of Revelation, but we're going to go here for a second. Uh, I think this is it, chapter five. Um, Methuselah. Yeah. Methuselah. Right, do you all know what his name means? Does anybody know what his name means? This is one of the sons of Enoch, Methuselah. Uh, well, I'll just tell you. Now, now, uh, in the in the lineage that we're that we are presented here in Genesis chapter five, one of the last names that you're going to see here is in verse thirty two, Noah. You see Noah here, and um, anyone want to take a guess at what Noah was famous for? What the go ahead, Yes, go ahead. Say it again. Building the ark. Building the ark. And why, why was he building a boat? That's the ark. Why was he building the ark? Because God told him he was going to bring rain on the earth. Yeah, amen. And what was that rain going to do? It was going to destroy the earth. On everybody. What was that? It said wipe out everybody. Wipe out everything. Yeah. So there was going to be death, right? Yes. Let me see. I'm going to, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to try this though. Let's see. I don't know if it's going to work. Methuselah. Um, his name has a number of different meanings, like man of the dark is one. Uh, 
But yeah, I don't think it would really. I don't think it really give me the full expression. Man with the dark, dark dying, or there's another way that his name is expressed, like um, when he dies, it shall come. Yeah, when he dies, it shall come. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I mean, his name means when he dies, it shall come. And what shall come? The flood shall come. And what Lewis was alluding to is all of these names in this genealogy that is expressed in the fifth chapter of Genesis paints a picture, a prophetic picture of what God was doing. So anyway, um, as a matter of fact, when Jesus dies, then that means that life will come. When when Methuselah was born, Enoch saw the end, and so he named his son Methuselah to say that uh, when he dies, it shall come, or the flood shall come, or the change will come, or the death will come, followed by a new life and a new world. And that's what Jesus did. He brought in a new world, but it can only come after his death. And again, everything that God was doing was pointing to um, down the road towards Jesus. So even though Methuselah, his name, as you can't really see it here in the definitions that are brought up, but his name, when when he dies, it shall come, is telling the story of what's going to happen when he dies, that it or the flood or the the destruction is going to come followed by life. When Jesus came, death came, he had to die on the cross, but he was also going to bring an end of the rule of Satan and sin over mankind and give man a new way into life. And that's why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So anyway, Lewis's point was, you get a lot of what God is saying right here, looking at the names, these names of people in the genealogies that's in Genesis chapter five. So anyway. Yeah, and if I may, Pastor, I'll I'll do it right quick. I got it right here, right now in front of me. Adam, Adam meaning man. Seth meant appointed the meaning of, the, of each one of these people's names. Seth meant appointed. Enosh meant mortal. Kenan meant sorrow. Uh, Mahalalel, the blessed, the blessed God. Jared uh, meant also shall come down. Enoch means teaching, a teacher. Uh, Methuselah, his death shall bring. This is the meaning of these names. Uh, Lamech, the, the, the despairing. And Noah meant comfort or rest. So when you put all that together, it says man's appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. That's what all those names mean in the Hebrew and the genealogy. And they are in that line. And that's the way they are written. And it is just amazing when I've seen that. Amen. Amen. And who could see that just outright? Again, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. <laughs> and that's what we should be about. We're, we're, we're in a place where it becomes more and more important to understand what the mind of the Lord is, because the more you're exercised in what the mind of the Lord is, as you're going through life, especially a life that's heading towards in in the terms of Jesus this generation shall not uh this generation shall not pass away until all things are fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away so the more of the word that we have in us the more we are in tune with what god is saying about the days that are ahead that's coming bringing everything to a head and a conclusion. The less that we are exposed to the word of God, 
the less effective we are in hearing what God is saying. And, and, our, and our hearing can be dull because we're not reinforcing things that he said out of the word into our spirit. So it's very important for us now to have more and more of the word in us, exposed to as much of the word as possible, so that as these days that are ahead are unfolding, we can be in step with God and not lost and not just bewildered like the rest of the world as to what is happening, which brings me back to the book of Revelation to talk about what's what's coming. So uh, what question is on your mind? You know, whoever has a question about the book of Revelation, what question is there that you have that we can maybe look into tonight? And uh, hopefully what we've talked about so far has been somewhat useful. Uh, but we're back to the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is in front of us. This day is in front of us. So uh, what other things in this book might you have on your mind that you'd like to explore? I have a question about Revelation 10, where it talks about uh, the little book. And um, it was talking about eating uh, uh, the, the book and the belly being bitter. But then in the mouth, uh, and in the mouth is sweet. I'm like, uh, so what's going on? What's going on with that? Mm. And it's 8 to 11, Revelation 10. Okay. Let's just read that. It says, uh, can everyone see my software? I think you can. You the Bible right? software, yeah. Uh, so, verse 8, it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth, which itself is uh, profound, angel standing upon the sea and the earth, and went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. But as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Okay. So eating the book, sweet in the mouth, bitter in the belly. I'm going to say that I don't know everything about this. I mean, I've read it many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. I believe I have uh, an idea. Mm -hmm. um, as I said before, there are things that I'm far more confident about when I go through the book of Revelation. And there's some things that I'm just not as confident about. But I, I, I feel that I'm not too far off in understanding what this is. Mm -hmm. uh, because... This is about being able to take the word and it's um, sweeter than honey. I mean, it, right. there, there's a passage in the Old Testament, I think it's in the Psalms, that talks about um, the word of God. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me just, let, let, me, let me ask a question. Does anyone remember? Uh, of psalm that talks about the word of God being sweet, sweeter than a honeycomb. Is it 19 or is it 91? Psalms 91 or 19? Uh, I think. Because we used to sing the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul when we used to sing it. Yes. The testimony said the Lord is true, making it wise and simple. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
more to be desired of they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and honey and, honey honey and what are we talking about? We're talking about the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord. We're talking about his word. Hmm. And and the book is the book of the words that are to be spoken back out because in the last part of what we read, starting in verse eight, he says, go get the little book and eat it. Verse 11, uh, the angel says, well, you've got to prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So you could take the word in and the word can be like, you know, my mind just went to this thing, and, and it is Psalms 19. It's Psalms 19. My, my mind went to Psalms 19 about this, about these things that uh, describe what God has given in terms of his law, his commandments, his testimonies, things that he said that are the law, things that he said that are his commandments. Things that he has said that have led to great testimonies. All of this comes from the word, the word of God. Mm -hmm. And in this book, this book is composed of the word of God that is to be spoken back out. So when you're taking it in, it is sweet. I mean, we can eat and digest the word. And as it's coming in, it can be so wonderful. And um, just like the scripture says, it is sweeter, more to desired, more, des more to be desired than gold, and yea, uh, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Sweet. So sweet as honey, honey. So that's what it makes me think of. It takes me back to this psalm but when you digest it when you digest it what's going to come up out of that because the word is in you and it needs to be and, and in this scenario and in this situation these words are going to be very hard the word is going to be prophesied is going to be very difficult, very challenging. It's when we go into chapter 11 and there's the measuring of the temple and then there is the two witnesses and the kinds of things that they have to say. Mm. Um, like in verse... Um, well, verse 4, chapter 11, it says here, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the Lord of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy. In the last verse of the previous chapter, he is told, John is told, you've got to prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so in the day of their prophecy, as we go into chapter 11, verse 5, there's things that are happening, very negative things that are happening. So it's bitter. It's great to take the word in, but it's going to be, it's going to be the fury of the of the fierceness of God that's going to be released when it's spoken. Mm. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, I was just thinking, um, you know, I think I heard you say that people, sometimes when you give it the word, uh, it, it's going to make some people angry, but then they're going to love it. <laughs> I, I was I was thinking about that too, but that that's better clarification because I was kind of stuck on how your mouth and your stomach, uh, in your your how is it that your stomach is not uh, getting the sweetness, but it's two different types 
of avenues in reference to how the word comes out. Yeah. So I get it now. Yeah, there's a serious intensity of the words that are being prophesied in this because we're talking about we're talking about the um the judgments of god that have to come as a result of the the behavior of the nations and the rejection of the word of god of the nations which is going to cause a response from heaven, but God takes his time before these things are executed. As a matter of fact, uh, let me just do this. Um, Second Peter three, verse 10, well, verse nine. We're looking at the millennium the last time we're together. We're looking at verse eight. Be, uh, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. And we haven't really fully uh, exhausted that subject, haven't fully prosecuted everything that can be said there. But coming from that thought and staying where we are right now, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, as he say here, long-suffering, to usward, yeah. Long so he is very, very patient. Long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's taking his time before he executes this judgment. He's giving people space to repent, and if they don't. If they don't begin to make moves towards repentance, they're going to be victimized by a continuation of their behavior of rejecting what God has said. Things have come to such a head in our day that it can't be ignored any longer, even though God is being very patient and he's expecting his church, he's expecting everyone that he's called out to take some responsibility and helping people to understand the day that they're in and the weight of rejecting the, the weight of, of, of the price of rejecting what God is saying is required to escape judgment and to be with him and to be part of the solution of the solution is coming through his people. As a matter of fact, notice here, if I come back, um, all right, we, we, we're talking about taking and eating the word, uh, eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but in thy mouth it shall be sweet. So we, we're going to be eating it, and then there's a regurgitating, there's a speaking out, there's, a prof there's the days of the prophecy of these two witnesses. Witness is, the witnesses are not just two people. For the last year, we've been talking about how to become a stronger witness. You are a living witness. So this is not about necessarily two people. This is about the people that have become the witnesses of God in the earth. In other words, the church is carrying the anointing of Moses and Elijah. And it says here that um, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score, uh, a thousand two hundred and three score uh, days in Sekal. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. Two olive trees, two candlesticks. I don't know if I want to break that open right now. I just want to say that the people that are prophesying, prophesying, they're bringing stuff into the earth that's hurting people. They're bringing the judgments of God like Moses. 
They're bringing the manifestation of the judgment of God like Elijah did when they had that little contest of whose God is really God, the God that brings fire from heaven, he is God. So he was dealing with not just 450 prophets, but 400 other prophets that were called prophets in the groves. There were prophets that were there with Jezebel, and there were prophets that were in the grove. And when you combine them, it's 850. And he was one man saying, I'm going to show that who you're worshiping is not a god. Surely you are worshiping a spirit, and that spirit is Baal. But it ain't God. He's not God. And God's going to impede anything that Bell can do to keep it from happening just to show you who's got all the power. So call upon Bell, tell him to bring the fire down, and he's not going to be able to do it. Then when it's my turn, I'm going to call the fire down. It's going to lick up everything on this altar that we've created to show who's God is going to answer by fire to consume the sacrifice on this altar, but God's going to, going, to, going to impede Baal. Baal's not going to be able to do anything. But when I speak, not only is the fire going to come down to consume the sacrifice, it's going to lick up all the water that's going to be around it, because I'm going to douse it with barrels of water, douse this altar with barrels of water, seven of them, and he's going to lick it all up. Then you're going to know who's God. So here's Elijah and here's Moses calling upon the power and the presence of God to overcome wickedness and the gods that are in the earth. All those judgments that came from Moses, he was judging the gods of Egypt. That, that situation that happened with Elijah, he was bringing a judgment upon the prophets of a false god who could not muster up the power to answer his 850 prophets. And Elijah is going to show that God, the God of the Bible that we study, the God of Egypt, I mean, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is the God. And so all of those things happen to point to something that was going to come way down the road. And what it was pointing to is these witnesses of which the, the church is being groomed to be the witnesses. As a matter of fact, everything that we do as being part of the body of Christ is to groom us to learn how to walk with God to rule with God, to declare things with God, to, to have the character to carry that kind of authority and that kind of power to do these things. So, um, so anyway, um, it's the people of God, basically, that are there uh bringing the presence of God the way that Moses did it and the way that Elijah did it. So it's kind of deep. It's kind of hard what they're saying. And that's why they can gladly take in the word. They can eat the word. But when it comes out of them, it's in their belly. And it's got to come out of them. It's very, very bitter. It's very, it's going to be harsh. It's going to be harsh. So, all right. <laughs> Let me hear somebody else amplify on this. I'm going to shut up for a minute. Wow. Come on now. It's about 13 of us on this car or more. And somebody's got some things you can say about this. So, just well, I have. I have a thought. Uh, my initial thought when, as you read those passages that Sylvia mentioned, I was thinking about the far as the bitterness is the suffering that comes about um, when you are speaking out the word or even when you're trying to live the word sometimes. And, you know, you think about the suffering of Christ, uh, Moses, you know, all of them, Paul and all of them, you know, they suffered to a degree. 
uh, for the sake of the gospel. So that was one of the things, one of my thoughts about that passage, as far as the bitterness. Very true. Very true. Um, I don't, you know, how can I say this? With everything that we do in the body of Christ, we want to enjoy our walk with the Lord. We want to have a good time with the Lord. But at the same time, there's some very tough realities that are associated with walking with Jesus. I, I heard these brothers one time say something that I thought was very apropos, very appropriate when they said, it is fun to follow Jesus until you find out where he's going because he's heading toward the cross. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Yeah, and it's very, very true. I mean, we want to, you know, in America, we've had a very, um, a very blessed existence in this nation, not dealing with the same kind of stresses, right. and, uh, opposition, and harshness that other places put Christians through. Like if you were in an Islamic nation and you were talking about Jesus, you could probably be not only incarcerated, but killed. Or if you're in China, or if you're in Russia, or if you're in any of those places that have at their foundation atheism that fuels their political perspective, atheism that works against God. So communism is based in atheism. Socialism is based in atheism or at the best agnosticism. However, Christianity or being a Christian is what perpetuated the desire to set up this nation based on things in scripture. And so the whole existence of being in this nation was one that was based on people that were fleeing the opposition and the oppression that they experienced in their other nations to come to this place to be able to worship freely. But because of the change of paradigm in the, in the perspective and the philosophy of this nation, it's becoming more and more anti-Christ, more and more um, amenable to atheism and agnosticism, or even more open to counterfeit concepts of God, so that the pressure of being a believer in a place where people don't want to talk about it anymore is greater and greater and greater. So if we can withstand that and we can continue to hold on to the truth, we'll get stronger and stronger and stronger. But at the same time of all this opposition, we're still trying to enjoy being here. We're still trying to have a good time. You know, we, we pretty much do anything that we want to do. We enjoy our lives. But there's coming, because of the pressure, this necessity to deal with this pressure and to deal with what God is really calling us to. And we're, we're going to find ourselves needing to be tougher, literally, stronger, more resilient, more um, um, giving ourselves over to enduring hardness. So Denise, when you brought this up about the, the, the tough side, the, the, the bitter side, that is something that we as believers may need to become more and more acquainted with, even though we're not trying to, but the world around us is pushing that on us. It's pushing us toward this point until the, the harsh reality of this, this nation turning its back so completely on God that they'll begin to come after us with greater desire to shut us up or do something worse. <laughs> and we've just got to be able to deal with that. And uh, so anyway, there is this more difficult, challenging side of walking with Jesus that we are looking at it is we're, we're going to have to face it so as i said i would love for us to be able to just have fun kick back and enjoy life without any care in the world but the world is making it harder for you to live that way 
and the things that, that you are being subjected to, God is going to begin to call upon each one of us to recognize this is why I put you here in this time. This is why you're here. I, I have a people that I that I knew would be able to not only withstand the opposition that is growing in a free nation, but begin to embrace the call of walking with the Lord, enduring the hardness, and definitely coming to a point where we'll want to take in more and more of that word because it's good for us. But we we also have to come to a place of maturity where we can release the harsh things that God is going to be expecting mm -hmm. to say and to prophesy. Mm -hmm. Pastor Jeff, because the word said, does say that we were born for such a time as this. Yes. Yes. Born for such a time as this. Uh, yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's some good words. Other thoughts there, folks. Other thoughts. Thoughts on that? Well, I have a question, Pastor, because uh, I, I know you're like me. I, I always look at the local news and the events, everything that's going on in the world, and I always try to equate it to things in the Bible. How do I find it in the Bible? Uh, and, and wow. And I always say that, that reading the Bible nowadays is just like reading the newspaper. Because everything that uh, that you see is happening, it's in there. But one thing that, that that I don't know if people have taken notice of, and I'm just throwing that out there by curiosity, because about the U River Euphrates, you heard that thing is drying up, right? Yep, I've heard it. And and a lot of people are out there really concerned and talking. I was talking to people about that uh, earlier in the week, uh, last week actually, and um, you know, they, it it was just a good witnessing tool. It is because you know even in Revelation nine, uh, I believe it's where 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 it was at, and uh, and it talks about the river Euphrates, about the four demons that are uh, that will be loosed from the river Euphrates that were bound there from thousands of years ago or would, whenever God bound them. But not only that, just below that, you also talk about a, a, a two hundred million man army coming across the river Euphrates. I said, just think about that for a moment. And we, we never in our history have ever had any nation that had over 200 million men. And we got somebody that's hating our guts right now, which is called China, which has over 200 million men army or million person army. I mean, we really need to think about these things that are happening and how they're happening. And is God trying to give us a wake up call? Is he trying to say, hey, pay attention to what's going on? Because, uh, those things in Revelation 9 are just about set up for something. Just saying. Just saying. Um, well, can I, can I be honest with you? Well, I'm always going to be honest with you all. Some things, uh, some things I try not to see, try not to hear, but I can't, I can't help it. I, I, I know about things, and, and when I, when I become aware of them, my my spirit immediately brings up realities of things that God has shown me. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Uh, maybe 25 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, there was so much that God began to show me about the end uh, and about the meaning of things that were happening around us that was pointing toward the end pointing towards a very difficult life in America and looking at the way that God dealt with Israel. And he's telling us very plainly the way that he dealt with Israel is the way that he deals with those that say that are his, but they're rejecting. And as you all know, Israel would go back and forth and back and forth, and they would experience judgment even though they were the people of God. And it's there in the scriptures for our learning, and it's on purpose to show us what's coming. So 25 years ago, I started seeing all these things, and I'm like, I can't, I can't look at it anymore. I mean, I, it started, it was making sense. It was somewhat, somewhat intimidating, and I just wanted to kind of look at 
at, at the scriptures to find all of those faith-oriented things that everyone else was happy to learn about because we wanted to be happy Christians doing happy stuff, not the stuff about the, the impending judgment of God. So I started to back away from it. But again, the Lord was pressing upon me to pay attention, look at these things. I, you know, it's like he was giving me a break, but the break's over. It's been over for, for a little while. And he's saying, I want you to get back into this. But people, I can say this. I do know that there is a way to have joy. There is a way to be happy in the Lord in spite of the deep, dark things that are happening around us. He does not want us to walk around being sour and angry and upset or depressed or disturbed or worried or anxious. And none of that. He doesn't want it. That's not the deal. The deal is your strength, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So we've got to bear in mind that there is a joy that can be constantly flowing in us as we are learning this. And that's part of what the Lord has been teaching me, that there is a joy. So having said that, looking at what's happening around us, um, I wasn't aware of what was happening in China until Van called me and said, did you see what's happening in China? I said, no, I didn't know, because sometimes I'm just not trying to see it. But he said, yeah, yeah, you need to check it out. So, yes, I, I, I've looked at what's happening in China. And what I'm going to say to you all is this. If you look at China, and I mentioned it earlier, this is an atheistic country. Communism is based in atheism, okay? And the, the desire of the communists is to control the people control the masses. If you start telling people that they can be free in God, that's going to start messing things up. That's going to bring opposition of the communist government against the individuals that that um, preach that. That's why churches are basically outlawed in China because of the differences of the philosophical um foundations of the of the nation of china versus let's just say the united states we believe in freedom and democracy they do not they believe they want their people to believe that they have freedom in communism but here lately because of what happened with their lockdowns and a fire that happened in one of the cities all across china all across china in the last 48 hours or so or more, you've had these open protests of people demanding the end of the lockdowns, demanding freedom, demanding freedom, demanding to be heard, demanding democracy. This is going to... Uh, this is going to draw the ire. It's going to... This is going to bring the angst of the Chinese government against its own people. And it's going to also want them to want to do something about the infiltration of this thinking of democracy and freedom. They want to shut that down. And maybe the way that they've got to shut it down is they've got to go to the place where this is coming from. Where is this thinking coming from? Well, still, even with all the crappy things that happen in the United States, it's coming from the United States. So what they're going to want to do is shut down the United States the best that they can, even if it means coming in, invading this place, and bringing us into communist dominion. It is... It is very much, I believe, part of the plan. Mm -hmm. So this is why we have to be, as the Bible says, be vigilant, be sober, uh, to uh, be circumspect looking at the world. The Bible says be circumspect and be not uh, unwise understanding what the will of the Lord is. 
So walk circumspectly. Circumspect means to look around. Keep your head. I like this saying. It's usually a sports saying. Keep your head on a swivel. <laughs> Keep your head on a swivel. Looking at your world. Knowing what's happening in your world. Even though we are not of the world, although we are in the world. So that's just one that's just one aspect of a dynamic of a nation and the thinking in that nation to want to shut down things that work against the philosophical strength of China or Russia or Islam. And there's looking to be a strange kind of relationship that emerges between Islam and Russia. Just look for it. Look for, I'll tell you this, look for a greater influence of voices, political voices coming out of France. Just look for it. I, I think the Lord has said something about um, France, leadership in France becoming more influential in the world and more anti-Christ focused. So there, there are things that are happening all around us that says we're going to probably have to put away our toys and start pulling out our weapons. Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down the strong. We're going to have to get very, very exercised in how to walk in God, how to walk in the gifts of the Spirit, how to talk to God, how to build up our spirit, praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, because all of that praying in tongues ignites revelation to see things in the scriptures, ignites revelation to just see things around you, ignites revelation, begin to prophesy and to move in the supernatural. That's what tongues does. That's why I gave it to us. So, uh, but anyway, I have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that's, that's like I said, I just, uh, I'm with you on that, Pastor. It's just looking what's going on around us and just prepare. Uh, especially spiritually, we have to prepare spiritually because if we don't prepare spiritually, the physical won't be able to stand it. No, it won't. Not only that, over the years, uh, we've gotten so many uh, prophetic words and um, different prophecies that alluded to be also ready. Um, it started out Years and years ago, a prophecy that used to come through Sylvia. Uh, you remember Sylvia? Something about fun and no more fun and frolic or whatever. <laughs> remember that word? We used to get off and things like that. But at the same time, we also got words that the church is going to arise. And we're being equipped to be able to handle. And in some instances, you know, we looked at scriptures about not loving your life until the death. And then there was a time where we were looking at um, the Book of Martyrs. I don't know if any of you all have read that. And how you get the impression that even when saints were um, coming up against death, like they used to burn at the stake they used to do these little signs that they really didn't feel what it looked like the fire was supposed to do. It was like the spirit of God was kind of, was somewhat protecting them or whatever. It, I mean, they made it, you know, I'm sure it was painful, I'm sure. But on the other hand, they had the protection of God as well in that moment. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the church really rising up um, the ones that say they're the sons of God, I believe that the Lord has equipped us or will equip us to handle whatever, you know, comes. You know, we look at all the supernatural stuff that happens in the, in the Bible, you know, even animals bringing you food and different stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, I'm just, you know, that part to me is exciting you know nobody wants to go through hardship or whatever but i think the church needs to learn how to 
live on a little less, maybe a lot less, <laughs> and just being able to really be comforted, you know, by the word. You mentioned earlier the joy of the Lord is our strength, and I'm sure that revelation will continue to unfold, you know, what that really means and what that detail, so to speak. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, you know, let's just talk about the that book was called uh, Fox's Books of Fox's Book of Martyrs, and um, they would they would give signs that they weren't being as tormented as their uh, as their uh, accusers and their judges wanted them to be, and there's this one situation. I'll just bring this out, and then I guess we can go. Um, there's a brother who's gone on to be with the Lord. He, he left here about three years ago. Um, his name is Neville Johnson. And Neville used to have these experiences with the Lord. And, uh, you know, people wondered, really, could you do that? Could you have the kind of experiences that he had? Yes, you can. Um, and I believe we're all called to begin to experience more in the Lord for our preparation and our maturity than what you thought you would experience. But one but one situation, he was taken by the Lord into a vision. And I'll just cut to the chase on this vision. Um, he was with a group of young people that were that were trying to um, breach the walls of the city. And the city was filled with people that were just out to kill them all. And, and, and the Lord Jesus was there in the midst of them. And he said, he, he said, I need one that will be a martyr. Who will want to do that? And they were all like, I will, I will. And so he points to this one girl and he says, you, you be the martyr. And we're like, you're hearing this, you're like, why? You know, what is this all this mean? But he steps forward, and as she approaches the city, there's a hail of gunfire that is that is released on her. And Neville said, when it happened, he just couldn't understand why it had to be this way. But he said, as she stood there, Letting them fire on her, he was taken into a close-up of her and the bullets coming at her. And when the bullets got like within, because it was like super slow motion, the bullets were coming and it got like a half an inch away from her body. And then immediately her spirit was just taken up out of her body. Mm. Or anything before the bullets could get there to create any pain, she was out of her body. And when she was taken out of her body, and they and they uh, dropped her body, you know, the bullets killed her. Something happened as a result of her death that her spirit left her body. But then something happened on the inside of that city, and it was like an explosion of light. There was an explosion of light, and then people could see. I mean, they had been, their, their minds and their eyes were dark, and they were so dark, they were just attacking people that were coming with the word of God. But when she died, she gave up her life, she left her body before any anxiety could happen, and then there was an explosion of light that happened in the midst of the city, and then people be, could begin to see who God really is. So that's just to say there are dynamics, there are things that affect other things in the spirit that we may have never even dreamed happen. But God knows what he's doing. And there's a glory in the death of the saints of God. So I just want to share that with you. And... Uh, if there's maybe one other thing that somebody would like to say that has not said anything, if you haven't said anything, please do.
Well, going once, going twice, <laughs> gone. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to ask, would someone like to close this out in a word of prayer? Don't everybody talk to your voice. Yes, go ahead. My God, we just thank you for allowing us to have the time to get together, to grow with the word, Lord God, to love one another and even love an enemy, Lord God. I ask that you continue to help us to grow in the godly understanding and knowledge of your word, Lord God, and wisdom. I ask that the word that we receive, that it dwell in us richly, Lord God, that we might be able to answer every man we just bless your holy name this evening. We thank you, Lord God, for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light for such a time as this. We give you praise, honor, and glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, folks. Love you all. Um, please do continue to pray for Donald. Um, pray for his strength in the Lord, that, that he can have a, a strong recovery. And, um, some of the other things that you may be aware of that are just challenged by different things, we definitely need to keep each other in prayer. Amen? Yeah. Yes. Amen. And I believe the men are going to be getting together, and the women are going to be getting together this weekend. The men have their time in the morning on a Saturday, this Saturday. The women have their time in the afternoon, this Saturday. So, uh, amen. Thank you all of that. And uh, mm. on that note, God bless you all. Love you all. God bless you too. Love you too, Pastor. Love you all. Love you all. Bless. 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 Love you all. God bless. God bless. Have a great night. Thank you.